Hello, I'm Charles Abraham from the University of Exeter Medical School. And in this short presentation, I'm going to talk about what we need to think about when we design outcome evaluations and what the challenges of designing outcome evaluations are. In a previous presentation on intervention mapping, which was about designing interventions, I distinguished three types of evaluation, outcome evaluation, process evaluation and economic evaluations. And we have other presentations on process evaluation and on economic evaluations. So this presentation uh, fits with those other uh, presentations and it's probably best understood in the context, particularly of the intervention mapping presentation. But today we're going to focus on outcome evaluations. An outcome evaluation is a test of whether an intervention has worked. Did it change whatever it was designed to change? That's what we want to find out when we're doing an outcome evaluation. So this is about, is the intervention effective? So interventions can be designed to change a wide range of outcomes. For example, people's knowledge of a health risk or their attitudes towards a particular behaviour pattern or to motivate them to undertake a particular pattern of behaviour or to actually change behaviour, for example, to encourage people to take more exercise, to encourage patients to uh, take their medication as instructed, or, for example, to encourage young people to use condoms. Alternatively, an intervention might be designed to target a health risk, for example, to reduce blood pressure or to reduce weight or body mass index, or to change the incidence of a particular disease, for example, to reduce heart attacks or to reduce sexually transmitted infections, or again to um, change the use of health services, to reduce GP visits or to reduce hospitalizations. All of these are potential outcomes for our interventions and the way in which we design the intervention is critically dependent on what kind of outcome we're seeking to change. When we design interventions, um, we can think of primary outcomes or secondary outcomes. So the primary outcome is the key thing that the intervention is designed to change. A secondary outcome might be other effects we expect the intervention to have, and in particular, effects that we think will follow from change in the primary outcome. So for example, we might design an intervention which is intended to promote well-being amongst a particular group, let's say patients with long-term illnesses. So that's the primary outcome here. The secondary outcome might be that we expect if we enhance well-being that these patients will make fewer GP visits. So a reduction in GP visits here would be a secondary outcome. If we think of a completely different intervention, let's say designed to help people lose weight, then weight loss would be the primary outcome, but we might expect that for those who are successful in losing weight, their well-being might improve. So here well-being becomes a secondary outcome. So the primary outcome is defined by what it is the intervention is meant to change. When we measure outcomes, it is critical that we have reliable measures. By reliability, we simply mean that the measure would give us the same score, or the same value, if it was used again and again in the same circumstances without there being any real change. So for example, if we were using a weighing machine to uh, measure weight, and we used it with the same person in the same afternoon, we'd expect it to give us the same results. If it gave us different weights, as we used it repeatedly, then we would say it was unreliable measure. So the measure itself is introducing measurement error into our calculations. So an unreliable weighing machine is of no use to us. So it's critical when we're designing interventions that we ensure that we have reliable measures of our primary outcome available. That's a key design feature. Our measures also need to be valid. By valid, we simply mean that the measure really is measuring what it's intended to measure. And there are two types of validity that people consider. One is concurrent validity, 
Concurrent validity is achieved when two measures of the same thing give you similar or the same results. So if, for example, we had two weighing machines and we measured a person on each of them and they both give us the same weight, then we would say not only are they both reliable if we use them over time and they give us the same weight, but if we're comparing two weighing machines, then they can be said to validate each other because each is giving the same result as the other. That's concurrent validity. A stronger form of validity is predictive validity. This is when our measure predicts something else in the future. So for example, if we had a measure of fitness and we find that that measure predicted performance on a fitness test later, that would add validity to our initial measure of fitness. So as well as ensuring that our measures are reliable, we also need to ensure that they really are measuring what we want them to measure. So we seek to have reliable and valid measures of our outcomes. Once we've decided on our measures and taken measurements of whatever it is we hope to change, then there's the question of how do we assess the size of change by how much has the thing changed? Now one way of measuring this is Cohen's D. There are other methods that can be used, but this is quite a common way in which uh, outcome evaluations assess the size of change that the intervention achieves. So if you look at the graph on the left of this slide, this is called a normal distribution. Now many of the outcomes we want to measure are not necessarily distributed through the population in this normal way. But some are. So for example, if you were to look at women's heights, then it is distributed in the way this normal distribution shows. If we make the assumption that our outcome measure is normally distributed, in other words, it would look like this graph, then we can think about what the intervention is doing as shifting the mean. So the mean before the intervention or in a control group is in the middle of this graph. It's in the middle of the two blue areas. But once the intervention has taken its course, then that mean, the average score on our outcome, might have moved slightly. And that's what's shown on the graph on the right-hand side. The solid line is the before uh, distribution of the outcome. And the dotted line is the after distribution, or the comparison between a control group, which has not received the intervention, and the intervention group that has. So you can see that the intervention group has moved, that the average score, or the mean score, is now higher in, this, uh, in the second graph here. So that shows that there has been a change. And the question is, how big is that change? So if you compare the two mean lines, the solid one and the dotted one, then what's the difference between them? Well, Cohen's D gives us a way of assessing that. So Cohen's D tells you how many standard deviations your intervention mean is away from your control mean. In other words, how many standard deviations in the outcome measure has your intervention managed to shift the group that has received it. What do I mean by standard deviation? Well, if you look at the left-hand side again, you can see the different colors represent standard deviations. So in a normally distributed outcome, um, one standard deviation below the mean and one standard deviation above the mean will account for about 68% of the population and three standard deviations out will have accounted for almost everybody. So if you think about moving an outcome measure on average across the population by one standard deviation, then you would move it from the mean, halfway between the two blue areas, right to the end of the blue area, bordering the red area. Now that would be a huge change because the new average score would be outside uh, the, the standard deviation. So you can see how where the new group would be very different to the group that generated the original mean score. 
So Cohen's D is a way of assessing how many standard deviations the intervention has changed the outcome by. So a D score of one means you'd have moved at one standard deviation, which as we've seen is a very big change. Uh, more typically, for example, in behavior change interventions, we see D values of about 0.2 or 0.3. So a D value of 0.25, for example, would mean that you'd moved the mean score by a quarter of a standard deviation. Now, while that's small compared to a whole standard deviation, if you look at these graphs, you can see that that might still be a substantial change. So when people report inter intervention evaluations, they might report a D value, and that tells you how many standard deviations the intervention and control group differ by. So the equation, as you can see here, is the mean of the intervention minus the mean of the control divided by the variability in the two groups, the pooled standard deviation. And we can roughly think about this as the number of standard deviations by which the intervention differs from the control. So although this is apparently a complex statistical equation. In fact, if we think about it in terms of these graphs, it's quite simple to understand what a d-value means, and it gives us a good way of thinking about by how much has an outcome changed. So once we've calculated a d-value, then uh, how should we judge it? Well, one way of judging it is statistically, and Cohen, who developed the measure, has offered some guidelines here. So Cohen suggests that 0.2, which is a fifth of a standard deviation, um, is a small effect. 0.5, half a deviation, half a standard deviation, is a medium sized effect. And 0.8, on 80% on of a standard deviation, is a large effect. But these are statistical guidelines, um, and that only makes sense in the context of your understanding of how much change you expect your intervention to have on your particular outcome. But these uh, statistical guidelines are also often reported when we're reporting outcome evaluations using d-values. So more importantly then, than um, the statistical guidelines on how to assess d-value, is our real-world understanding of what it means to have achieved an effect of a particular size using an intervention. So what we need to know is, is this effect trivial? Is it beneficial? Is it hugely important? And that can't be judged by looking at the statistical size in itself. We need to understand the reality of what the change means. So for example, a small effect size, for example, an effect size of 0.2 or 0.25, let's say a fifth or a quarter of a standard deviation, could be really important in certain circumstances. So a small change of that kind might be critical, for example, to the fitness of an elite athlete, or it might be critical to a population effect where this change has occurred across a large population. So for example, a small reduction in the use of emergency services might make a big difference to how well they function. So the fact that an effect is small does not necessarily mean that it's unimportant. And equally, the fact that an, an effect is statistically large in Cohen's terms might not mean it's important in the real world. So this is what we talk about as clinical or practical importance of our of the changes that our outcome evaluation reveals. And this has to be thought about and decided at the point where we're designing our intervention. So you need to anticipate what size of change is important versus what size of change is trivial. So to give you an example, let's say we're designing an intervention that is um, that we think will help people lose weight. And the intervention's going to run, let's say, for three months. So at the end of a three-month period, what kind of weight loss are we going to count as a success? So if, for example, the intervention achieves 
a two kilogram difference between the people in the intervention and the people who were not in the intervention, is that good? Would we say that's a success? Or might we say, well, unless it achieves 5% reduction in body weight, 5% additional to that found in the control group, then it's not effective. So the clinical or practical importance of the intervention has to be, has to be decided a priori, as it were, at the point of design, not at the point of measuring the outcome. And that is decided not by statistical tests, but by clinical or practical judgments about what really matters in the real world. Okay, so imagine we've designed the intervention and we've decided on our outcome measures. How will we measure these? What sort of evaluation design will we use? Well, here I'm just going to briefly compare three commonly used designs. The first is a simple pre-post design. This is where you measure the outcome amongst the people who are in the intervention at the beginning of the intervention before they receive it. So you might measure their weight or their adherence to medication or their use of GP services or whatever the outcome is. And then you make the same outcome again at the end and you ask yourself, is there any difference? And this is called a pre-post test. Now this is a weak test of our intervention because we don't know if there would have been change for these people on the outcome measure even if we'd not used the intervention. So let's say it's possible that people might have lost weight anyway for some other reason other than the intervention. If we observe weight loss and we then say, oh, this is due to the intervention, we might make a mistake here. We might mistakenly attribute change to the intervention when it was naturally occurring change. So for example, people who are quite ill may recover spontaneously and so they get better regardless of the treatment. So in that case, the change is not due to the treatment, but due to spontaneous recovery. So a pre-post design doesn't allow us to distinguish between naturally occurring change and change that is generated by the intervention. So a second, stronger model then, is where we use a matched control group. So in this case, we take pre and post outcome measures for the intervention group, like in a pre-post uh, design, but we do the same thing for another group of people who do not receive the intervention. Now we can look at change in the control group and we can say, well, that change can't be due to the intervention because these people didn't receive the intervention. And then we can subtract that change from the change we see in the intervention group. And this gives us a better indication of the change that might have been brought about by the intervention. So if we have a group who receive an intervention to encourage them to take their medication better, and we have another group of the same patients who do not receive the intervention, then if we see no change in that control group, we can reasonably make the assumption that the change is due to uh, the intervention having an effect on those people who received it. So that's why a control group is critical. It allows us to assess naturally occurring change and distinguish this from change that's generated by the intervention. Now match control groups have a little bit of a problem because it's still possible that the people in the control group are different to the people in the intervention. So for example, let's say we use one GP practice for the intervention and another for the control. It's possible that those two practices differ in the type of patients they attract or in what they do within those practices. So that might mean you do get changes in one or the other, for example, in the control group, that you can't really know why that's going on. So um, the intervention group might change much more than the control group, but that might be in part due to differences in the GP practice, not just the introduction of the intervention. So our match control groups might differ in terms of naturally occurring change in ways that we haven't measured. 
So that's a weakness about match controls. On the other hand, match controls may often be the best design that we can uh, achieve for practical reasons. A more robust design, a stronger design, is a randomized control trial. In this case, people are brought into the study and at random allocated to either the intervention or the control. Now this design means that many differences between people who are then placed in the control versus the intervention group are controlled in the sense that the, the random allocation means that those differences should be equally distributed into the intervention and the control group. So this is a stronger way of controlling for uh, naturally occurring change. And that's why randomized control trials are often regarded as a gold standard type of evaluation. However, there are many practical difficulties in running randomized control trials. And for some problems, it's impractical or impossible to run a randomized control trial. And in that case, a match group design is going to be the best option. Once we've decided on our uh, evaluation design, then another question we need to address is when are we going to measure the outcome? Now clearly we need to measure the outcome before the intervention and after. But do we also need measures of the outcome during the intervention? Such intermediate outcome measures show us the progress towards change. So if you have a three month intervention and you take a measure at one month and two months, then you can see whether people progress through the intervention. For example, if they're losing weight, do they lose weight cumulatively? A little bit to begin with, more in the middle, and uh, further weight loss towards the end. So these are intermediate um, measures, and these are particularly important to process evaluations where we're asking, how did the intervention work? Post-intervention measures that are taken immediately after the intervention are give you a good idea of what did the intervention achieve. So these are immediate post-intervention measures and these are very common in outcome evaluations. What they don't tell you is whether the change that was achieved is maintained over time, whether it's stable or whether it disappears after a short time. So let's say we find an intervention that effectively changes weight after three months. Then the question is, do those people put that weight back on over the subsequent six months? Or at nine months, would they still show that same weight loss? So this is a measure of maintenance. So longer term follow-up measures are required if you want to know whether an effect generated by an intervention is maintained over time. And for many health-related measures, this is what we want to know. It's not enough, for example, to encourage people to lose weight or change another health risk behavior or take their medication uh, according to instructions if they stop doing so almost immediately when the intervention changes. Now, what we really want to achieve is a stable or maintained change. And for that, we need longer follow-up uh, outcome measures as well as immediate post-intervention outcome measures. We can distinguish between outcome evaluations that are efficacy evaluations and those that are effectiveness evaluations. So an efficacy evaluation asks the question, could this intervention be successful? So in this case, we're thinking about if the intervention is delivered very well, so with fidelity by experts in favorable or ideal circumstances, can it bring about the, effect, the desired effect? So efficacy evaluations, including efficacy trials, tend to be small scale. For example, they might just consider two different sites. For example, two different schools, two different hospitals, two different GP practices. And the question is, could a change occur? Or they might be uh, evaluations that take place in laboratory settings. So that's an efficacy evaluation or an efficacy trial. Once you've conducted such an efficacy trial, you know that your intervention 
could be effective, but it doesn't guarantee that it would be effective when it's rolled out into the real world. So when it becomes a routine practice, would you still see the effect sizes? And that's why you need to undertake an effectiveness trial or an effectiveness evaluation, because this looks at change over time, for example, across multiple sites, many populations in the real world, when, for example, the intervention is integrated into routine practice, routine care. So these are effectiveness evaluations. These tend to be complex and expensive evaluations, so it's probably advisable to have conducted an efficacy evaluation showing that it's possible to observe real change from the intervention before we invest in larger scale real world effectiveness trials. So that's the distinction between efficacy and effectiveness outcome evaluations. So now I want to talk through some practical challenges that might arise when you're designing an outcome evaluation. So one of the first things to think about is that the intervention might have multiple effects. We've already talked about primary outcomes and secondary outcomes, but it might be for some intervention that there are many secondary outcomes. And another consideration here is that even when an intervention is effective, we should be considering whether it might have other negative outcomes. So even if it achieves its target, might it have other negative or adverse effects? So these are things to think through when we design our outcome evaluation. And really, we want to be able to measure not just the primary outcome, but multiple measures that we th multiple outcomes that we think the intervention might give rise to, as I say, including potentially negative outcomes. So that means we might need multiple measures, and we might have to model these using fairly sophisticated statistical techniques, and we might need advice on how to do that. Another uh, practical problem is how we take outcome measures. Um, outcome measures could be affected by the expectations of a researcher. Let's imagine, for example, that a researcher is measuring weight, and they know which people are in the intervention designed to help them lose weight. This might mean that they have a tendency, let's say, to round down the weight or to look for lower weight readings. So this is called experimenter or researcher expectations. And the way we get around this is we try and blind our researchers. So for example, ideally, they don't know who's in the intervention group or who's in the control group. Now, sometimes this is not possible, but it's something that we need to think through when we're considering our outcome evaluation. Could the researchers or experimenters affect the measures themselves? If we're running a randomized control trial, then there are a series of channels involved in randomization. We have to, for example, be very careful who we take into the study. So we have inclusion and exclusion criteria. And this can be quite a complex process. So randomization creates challenges in itself for outcome evaluations. If we're looking at small effects in particular, we might need very large samples to show them. So if the effect that we're seeking to bring about is fairly small, but nonetheless important, we need a large sample in order to find that difference between the intervention and the control group. If the sample is too small, we might miss a real effect that is small. And this is uh, the area of statistical power. And there are a series of tests and methods by which we can calculate what sample size we need given the effect size that we are seeking. So if we know, for example, that we want a D we want to see a d-value of at least 0.25, then that helps us decide how many people we need to recruit into our intervention and control group. And one of the practical problems about large outcome evaluations is recruitment. Can we get enough people of the kind we are targeting? For example, if we're looking at patients groups, can we recruit enough patients so we can allocate them to the intervention and control group?
So that's a practical challenge that we need to think about during the design of the evaluation. Now a related issue is that even when we've recruited people into our intervention and control group, for various practical reasons, individuals might drop out, they might become too busy, they might move house, they might become ill, or whatever. So that means that the numbers in your intervention and control group might be lower than at the beginning of your evaluation. So this is something you need to anticipate. So we need to estimate this dropout, or as it's called, attrition rate. So we estimate how many people we think are likely to drop out, and then we recruit large enough samples so that even when those people have dropped out, the samples are still large enough to test for our, let's say, small effect size. So anticipating attrition is important. Another um, issue might be that when we have an intervention and control group, we want to make sure they're quite separate. So there might be a problem if we were using an intervention in a school and we use some classes as the intervention group and some as the controls. So the control group don't receive the intervention, the intervention classes do. But then what happens if the uh, students are uh, meeting together in a coffee room or playing in a playground, the intervention group may tell the control group about what's happening and that might change the control group. So in other words, the control group are no longer a pure control group. They've been contaminated because they're now something more like the intervention group. So um, isolating intervention and control groups and ensuring that the intervention group does not contaminate the control group is an important design feature in outcome evaluations. So these are a series of quite different practical problems that we have to think about during uh, outcome evaluation design, which, if you remember, is that sixth step in intervention mapping at the design stage. Finally then, I just want to mention the concept of external validity. I've been talking about the validity of outcome measures, and I talked about concurrent validity and predictive validity. So this is about ensuring your measure really is it measuring what you want it to. But people have used the term external validity to mean something different, to mean uh, an assessment of whether the findings of an outcome trial are relevant to a wider population. Can you generalize from your evaluation findings to the larger population? Your intervention has worked in your effectiveness uh, trial, does that mean if it was rolled out across the country it would work more or less everywhere? So that's generalization. Can we generalize from our, uh, the results of our outcome evaluation to practice or service delivery more generally? And Glasgow and College have developed a framework for thinking about threats to generalizability or external validity and they call this the re-aim framework where R is for reach. This is how many people and what different types of people were included in the evaluation. So if the reach is small, only a small number of people, for example, people from a limited socioeconomic uh, background or from only a limited set of cultural backgrounds, that might threaten the generalization of the findings to other areas and other groups of people. So that's R for reach. Um, e is for effectiveness, and this is really just making the point that I've made already, that we need to measure multiple outcomes to understand effectiveness properly, including the potential that even an effective intervention could have some negative effects. A is for adoption. This is about the extent to which if we have an effective intervention, would it be implemented elsewhere? Would people say, yes, there's a good intervention, I'll use that in my hospital, or I'll use that in my school, or would individuals use it if, it, for example, it was a web-based intervention? This is adoption. Well, if an effective intervention is not adopted widely, it's not going to have any effect on the wider population. 
So this means when you're designing it, you need to think about making it attractive so that people will adopt it. I is for implementation. This is about whether the intervention is implemented correctly or with fidelity when you're testing it. So for example, if it's delivered in schools or hospitals, do the teachers or nurses or doctors actually do what they're meant to do in order to deliver the intervention? If it's implemented poorly, then it may not um, be effective, but even if it is effective, it may mean that it's not necessarily effective in the same way in a different setting if it's implemented in a, in a different way. So standardization of implementation is crucial to generalize from an outcome evaluation to practice elsewhere. And finally, maintenance, M is for maintenance. And this is again this point that does the effect, is it maintained over time? Do we see it at long-term follow-up? But also a related point, it, does the intervention remain being used in its context? Um, if you go back uh, two or three years later, is the hospital or the school still using the intervention? Even if it's been very effective and it's used, let's say, for a year and there are good results, if then a year later it has somehow gone out of fashion, it's no longer part of routine practice within the organisation, then clearly it doesn't have a long-term effect. So there's maintenance both at the individual level. Does the change still, is it still evident a while after the intervention? And then there's maintenance about the use of the intervention or its implementation. Does it continue to be used within an organisation? Glasgow and colleagues have pointed out that if these um, features, reach, effectiveness, adoption, implementation and maintenance are not monitored or not present, then even effective interventions may not have much impact on service delivery or on, or on health care. And in fact, we've also talked in other presentations about process evaluation and many of the things in this re model are exactly the things that might be assessed in a process evaluation that asks how is the intervention being uh, implemented, how widely is it adopted, um, etc. But these are also things to think about when we're designing an outcome evaluation. Okay, um, this is my uh, final slide and here I just want to summarise the points I've made in this presentation. So the key point I've been making is that when we're designing an evaluation, we really need to define the outcome measures. For example, the primary outcome measures and the secondary outcome measures that we're going to use to tell us what effects the intervention has. I've talked about ensuring that we have reliable and valid measures of outcomes. I've also pointed out that um, statistical assessment of effect sizes, while important, is perhaps less important than practical or clinical assessment of effect sizes. So this is about thinking before you do your outcome evaluation study, what counts as a trivial, beneficial or very important real world effect. And this uh, needs to be decided in consultation with experts and in understanding the environment or context in which the intervention is going to be used. So how important is the effect size that you find if you deem your intervention to be effective? Um, I've also talked about different evaluation, outcome evaluation designs pre-post, match control group and randomized control trials and talked a little about the advantages of match group and randomized control trials but also noting the practical difficulties of running randomized control trials. I've also talked about um, when you measure outcomes, for example measuring them before the intervention, during the intervention, after the intervention and at long-term follow-up in order to be able to measure maintenance. I've distinguished between efficacy evaluations. These are um, outcome uh, studies or evaluations that show us the potential the intervention has for change. Might it be able to work? So in these studies, um, we're looking at ideal conditions and perhaps small sample sizes. 
even when these show that an intervention is effective, we then need to go on to ask the question, will it be effective in the real world? Is it worth rolling out into routine practice, for example? I've talked about a number of practical challenges that we might uh, be aware of when we're designing outcome evaluation. And I've also talked about the concept of external validity, which is thinking about whether the findings of our outcome evaluation generalize or are relevant to other groups or to wider rollout in routine practice. So uh, that's the end of this presentation. Uh, those are the things we've considered here. Um, thank you for listening, and I hope it's been helpful in developing a better understanding of outcome evaluations and how we design outcome evaluations. Thank you.